Well, good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. My name is Manuel Roman Lacayo. I am the Associate Director for the Center for Latin American Studies. It is really a pleasure, and um, it is truly a privilege. Uh, this is my second time introducing the last conference since I've been here. And uh, I should say, this is the 26th iteration of the last conference. It's been going for more than 25, nearly 27 years. Um, it's been an effort that's been put together primarily by uh, our students who are last fellows under the uh, dutiful, uh, active and enthusiastic support and guidance of our assistant director for partnerships and programming, Ms. Amanda Hank. Um, some of the people who are here and in the overflow room have worked really hard uh, to make this conference a success. Uh, so we thank you for joining us, for being here. Um, I should mention also James Campbell, who is one of our um, graduate student assistants in uh, the Center for Latin American Studies, who's been uh, a constant thread in keeping the organization and the flow of what this conference will become uh, going for some months now. These are conferences that come together over, over a lot of planning and a lot of energy. Um, today, we have uh, the beginning of our three days of, of the last conference. We have Dr. Elario uh, Bobadilla, who is in the history department here at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, he is he has organized and will, will be facilitating and moderating a panel uh, that is very much aligned with what his research interests have been and continue to be, and dealing with issues of organization and uh, in the face of oppression, uh, of movements, people coming together for causes, and without really wanting to preempt uh, what the panel will be about, I want to basically just hand it all over to Dr. Bobadilla so he can tell you more about what we are about to, uh, to see for our inaugural panel today. Thank you, Manuel, and thank you all for being here today for this important conversation. I'm delighted to see the turnout. Um, as Manuel said, my name is Lodi Bobadilla. I'm here uh, in the history department. I can remember the history department. And uh, together with Alexander Finley, Marcus Redeker, uh, we run the Stoughton and Alice Lind Working Class History Seminar. Um, so we were <clears throat> really thrilled to put this together, although this could not have happened without the help and assistance and support of the Center for Latin American Studies. Caleb Greenberg, who is not here, is instrumental, as was Manuel uh, Roman Lacayo. So thank you, and Ms. Amanda Hank for putting this together um, so beautifully. Uh, so we're here to talk about the topic of sex worker labor and human rights organizing uh, in history, in our current moment, and in the future. And we have three different but complementary perspectives on this topic. Uh, and I could not be more excited to have you be here, um, these wonderful scholars and people who I'll introduce shortly. Before I do that, I want to uh, tell you about our final event um, that happens April 11th. It takes place on April 11th when Professor Reed Andrews delivers the Ethan Thompson le Lecture at 4.30 p.m. in the Frick Fine Arts Auditorium. If you're not already on our mailing list, there's a sheet back there. Please. Uh, Sign that sign sign your name and give us your email address and we'll be sure to send you reminders for that and future events. Hope you'll join us for that as well. And I hope you enjoy the rest of this amazing conference. And I want to thank, of course, our panelists for being with, uh, here with us today. We're delighted to have the presence and expertise uh, of you three to guide us in what I hope is a lively uh, and uh, important conversation. So I'll now introduce them and begin that conversation. Dr. Amalia Cabezas is, teaches at the University of California, Riverside in the Department of Media and Cultural, uh, Cultural Studies. She's the author of Economies of Desire, Sex and Tourism in Cuba and the Dominican Republic. And more recently, Latin American and Caribbean sex workers gained some challenges in the movement in anti-traffic and review. She's completing a manuscript examining the rise of the regulationist system, the quote, white slave narrative, 
and the political mobilization of Latin American and Caribbean sexual workers beginning in the 19th century. Dr. Leah Legrone is Mississippi Professor of History at Weber State University in Ogden, Utah. She is also the public history director there, and she received a PhD in history in 2021 from Texas Christian University in Fort Worth, Texas. Dr. Legrone studies the connection progressive reformers made between sex work and low wage, uh, low wages, excuse me, to lobby for minimum wage legislation for women. Her book, Sex Wages, The Fight Over Minimum Wage Laws in Texas, 1912 to 1923, is under contract with OU Press and examines both the national and state movements to link sex work to low wages paid by industrial employers, but also how plurality and race politics drove this discussion uh, on access to living wages. She's written on sex workers in the early 20th century, using the legal system to fight back against criminalization of their work and about sex workers in Mexico and the prostitute passports and protests, also in the, in the early 20th century. And Dr. Olivia Snow is a writer, researcher, and dominatrix. She's currently a visiting assistant researcher in the Department of Gender Studies at the University of California, Los Angeles, where she studies tech, uh, sex work, excuse me, tech and policy. Her work has appeared in academic and popular publications, including Wired, The Daily Beast, and The Chronicle of Higher Education. She holds a PhD in literature. Her favorite word is no. <laughs> I'm going to sit down um, and, and start with, uh, with some general questions. And, and I'm going to try to stay out of the conversation, other than asking these questions, because you have three people here who are much more interesting uh, than I am. So I'm going to let them do the talk. But I will start with uh, a question that I hope um, serves the kind of introduction to the work that each of you uh, do. And it's, a, I think, a basic question, but an important one that we often take for granted, which is what does sex work mean? Uh, who are we talking about when we say sex work? That can mean so many different things in so many different contexts. So again, by way of introduction, I'd, I'd love to hear from each of you um, about what, what that means in, in the work that each of you do. Which way do you want to start? Yeah. <laughs> However, you want to start with you. Okay, we can start in the early 20th century. Um, so for, for my work, um, to answer the first part of it, sex, sex work is uh, either women or men. I, I don't write as much about men who sell um, their bodies, their commodify their bodies, uh, for, um, for their, their occupation. Uh, but women, particularly what the 20th century defines, uh, early 20th century people define as uh, prostitutes. Um, so I will probably use that word, um, several times because that is kind of the, uh, the terminology used in the early 20th century, but also madams, um, pimps were considered a uh, part of the sex work industry, but also any woman who occupied vice districts, which is what I write on. So any of the red light districts, any woman that worked in the red light districts, and yes, it is mostly women. Um, women were the ones that were criminalized. Women were the ones that were labeled um, sex workers. Not a lot of the of the legislation at the time uh, targets men. Um, men as sex workers, I should say. Uh, the the legalities of that would just would would fall under. Um, sodomy laws, which I probably won't get into. But also within my work, you can see that uh, poor working class women fall under this umbrella because they were potential sex workers. So um, any woman who uh, was poor on the street looked like she had the potential to be a prostitute was arrested, charged for vagrancy. Vagrancy, of course, was a euphemism at the time for prostitution. And so once she was in the system as a vagrant, uh, she was in the system as a sex worker. 
So in the scope of my work, that's how um, sex work is defined. Okay, I'll go next. Um, good afternoon, every, everyone, and thank you so much for the invitation to be here today. So I come out of this um, from a, I come from a working class background. My parents were factory workers. My dad were an immigrant family and my dad worked in the steel industry. And my mother worked as a seamstress in Los Angeles, big factory, big sewing machines. So I grew up around factories and talking about labor issues. And it wasn't until I got to college and we, I was taking a class on HIV AIDS, uh, this is during the 1980s, um, that I heard a speaker in our class talk about uh, prostitution as a form of labor. And I thought, wow, this is really fascinating because I had always heard that being a prostitute was like the worst thing you could be. You know, don't stand on the street corner because people are going to think you're a prostitute. Don't wear this outfit because people are going to think you're a prostitute. Everything was policed by the figure of the prostitute. So I, I was just amazed, but I put that in the back of my mind and I went to graduate school looking to do um, a study on um, immigrant communities and class politics. And after a couple of years, that wasn't happening. And a friend of mine uh, contacted me in the midst of my frustration and said, do you know that there's an article on Playboy magazine? I did not read the magazine, <laughs> not one of the things I read, but she said, there's a Playboy magazine that has a pictorial of Cuban women. I go, oh, this is really, really strange because Cuba as a communist country have banned um, beauty pageants and all kinds of forms of uh, sexual objectification of women. They really went out um, early on against sexual objectification and uh, images and representations of women that they consider be, to be demeaning towards the communist um, revolution. So all of a sudden there's these, you know, beautiful Cuban women's and Playboy pictorials. I think it was the French pictorial. Um, and so I thought, you know what? I'm going to go to Cuba and find out what's going on. And when I got to Cuba, people were talking about uh, not so much prostitution or sex work. They were talking about jineterismo, which is a form of um, a jinete is someone who rides a horse. And so the idea at the time is that you're just playing with a tourist. You're just riding the tourist. You're just, but it was really ambiguous. And I noticed that when it was used in a pejorative way, it was attached to black women or mulatta. So mixed race women and black women. But a lot of light skinned women were doing the same things and they weren't being called uh, out uh, as jineteras or as any pejorative. So that from the very beginning, I noticed that there's a racial distinction happens. So I like the term sex work a lot, and I um, try not to use prostitution, but like you, I use it sometimes within a particular historical context. The term is used a lot in mobilizations in Latin America and the Caribbean. So a lot of the organizations use uh, trabajo sexual. In Mexico, they use um, sexo servidoras. So they try to connect sex to services, to the service industry. And I like that approach too. Um, in Brazil, there was a very charismatic uh, sex worker organizer, and she used from the very beginning puta. Poor. So that's a term that's also used. Uh, more recently from Argentina, the, uh, a term be, the term being used is puta feminista or feminist whore. And that is uh, to align yourselves with fem feminist politics uh, and to reclaim the pejorative of whore. So it's reclaiming 
that which has been uh, used to ostracize them. Um, I am still very uncomfortable at times with labeling anything and anyone this term of sex worker because I met in my research in the Dominican Republic in Cuba, a lot of, for example, resort workers who have relationships and encounters with tourists that are, I would say ambiguous or flexible or that can lean in many different directions. But both the tourist and the hotel worker do not consider themselves sex workers. They're looking for other identities. So they'll say, amigo, mi amiga, my friend, right? O el turista. Um, the money might not be exchanged. Uh, there might be romance, marriage, opportunities for migration, opportunities to visit other parts of the island or, or go into places that you otherwise wouldn't. So I don't feel, um, that in those situations, um, what I think what it does, it really um, brings up into question the ways in which we combine money and we combine love and sex and attention in all of our relationships. So in heterosexual marriage, in romantic liaisons, these all combine these elements. And so it's very difficult to then say, oh, you're a prostitute because you're a low income worker or you're in a third world country or, you're be or because you've been racial racialized. So those are my ideas around the term. <clears throat> uh, well, thank you for having me. It's exciting to be back in my hometown of Pittsburgh, born and raised. Um, so I came uh, to sex work not through academia, but as a sex worker. I started trading sex for money when I was 16 uh, down in the South Hills. Um, and my, um, my graduate work was primary, it was on um, the dehumanization of the laboring body under 19th century American industrial capitalism, um, which as it turns out, uh, translates quite well. Um, to sex work studies, to which I pivoted after I received my PhD and was outed to my uh, doctoral department. Um, so as for the idea of sex work, what, a, what sex work is, I mean, broadly, this is an umbrella that, that refers to a, a vast industry, right? Um, of adult content creators, porn performers, strippers, um, dominatrices, uh, full service sex workers, which is the... Um, like community term for what we might otherwise call a prostitute, full service sex workers, um, uh, sugar babies, uh, you know, did I say strippers yet? I probably did. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, list goes on. But um, I, for my own work, now that I, I um, primarily look at the algorithmic surveillance of sex workers by big tech, um, particularly uh, like cross-platform <clears throat> data sharing, um, tracing how sex workers get booted off of various platforms. Um, sex work and sex, sex workers constitute a socio-political category of people who are stigmatized workers, criminalized workers. Um, and though we may think of like, or, or would like to think like sex, sex work as a job. It's like I, you know, I could be a sex worker and then I would cease being one down the line. That is not the case in um, like the real world. Uh, like, yeah, just on my way here this afternoon, I saw a new story of a woman, I think in Ohio, who uh, got fired from her English teaching job because she had an OnlyFans. Um, it like, it does not matter when you were a sex worker. Um, and I mean, the temporality that, as you noted, even, you know, a, a potential future sex worker um, mm -hmm. is this kind of political category that excludes you from many parts of, uh, you know, everyday life, whether that's being able to have your own bank account, whether that's being able to travel um, internationally, um, sex worker, I mean, really is the most 
basic terms, a scarlet letter that you end up wearing for life. Um, so that's the uh, perspective that I, I take. Thank you all. Um, the next question I have is, is, I wrote here historically, or historical perspective, but <laughs> yeah. um, I'm a historian, so of course I'm going to start there. We don't have to end there, though. Okay. Uh, but let's start there. Historically, how have sex workers articulated their place in labor and human rights struggles? Um, how have they worked to move from the margins to the mainstream? Although what you said maybe complicates that that notion, uh, but again, historically and not, um, how have workers, sex workers, articulated their place in these struggles? Um, well, I think it's wise to start with Carol Lee, the sex worker <laughs> activist who really coined the term sex worker, mm -hmm. um, and the reason that she did that was. Um, its relation to policing and um and surveillance um she attended a what the way she came about it she attended a conference i want to say in 1972 it might be 78 um and there was some panel discussion on sex work but it didn't use the term sex work i think it used like sex you know trafficking or today i can't remember off the man um and this made her think of an experience that she had had recently as a sex worker, as a full service sex worker in San Francisco working in a brothel. She had been raped by a client and was unable to report it to law enforcement, not like they would have done anything if she had, but um, was unable to report it because that would then jeopardize the house entirely. Um, her role, you know, or she would be arrested as a prostitute before any anyone would be arrested for the crime of rape. Um, and she, you know, asserted um, sex work for again, a few reasons, one being um, as a strategic organizing move, um, because the community is so vast, because people um, are, and I mean, even with, there's within sex work, there's the, the hierarchy, right, when, which, uh, <laughs> Uh, the most stigmatized and criminalized uh, occupy the bottom of that, and the uh, so you know full service sex workers, and the least so you know cam models, OnlyFans girls, whatever occupy the highest. Um, people are so loath to identify as a prostitute, but a uh, sex worker is something that you know refers to any number of occupations. Um, so I mean that I'd say it was the yeah. Um, a formative moment, at least in American, United States American uh, labor. Um, so I'm just going to start with a little comment, uh, which I find interesting that you brought up with the OnlyFans, because, you know, I, I'm a professor in Utah now, and there's been several teachers who have been outed, uh, high school teachers who have been outed with having OnlyFans. And they make the the media, I guess this is where you come in, the media makes it a big deal about they were making a million dollars on OnlyFans and they need to make a choice. Well, they do make a choice. They stopped teaching high school, which I would go to <laughs> if I made a million dollars on OnlyFans. Um, but what historically, at being a histor historian as well, um, so I first came to this, to, to working on uh, sex work, prostitution, uh, another a term that I, I mostly use just because of the, like I said, of the time period. But um, I lived, in, I, I'm from Texas, um, lived in Laredo, Texas uh, for, if you don't know where Laredo is, it is on the border. Uh, we call it the gateway uh, the, the sister cities, uh, Laredo and Los Dos Laredo, right? Um, and so if you're in both of those cities, uh, right on the border in Texas, then you know that the, there is a fascination about the red light district in Laredo, which was right around the, the uh, military base there in Laredo. But also if you go across the border, it's either called the um, Zona de Tolerancia or Zona de Rosa, right? And so uh, it's a huge fascination, too, especially with what I call uh, sex tourism, or we, you know, other scholars have called sex tourism. And so it, it becomes this kind of rite of passage to 
get in your car and drive across the border and gawk at um at the red light district and the, the women who are working in the red light district and there, of course there's all kinds of really horrible stories but the way that, the way that i come at it is this these questions these larger questions around morality and labor so women's labor especially in the early early 20th century was always this this fear that women, white women especially, um, were going to somehow uh, fall into prostitution, fall into sex work, if you will, if they, if they were tempted. Um, and the temptation is that they are going to go work in these factory jobs um, and not make very much money. They didn't until later say, well, maybe we should pay women more money, right? It was like, oh, well, they're going to work in these factory jobs. They're not going to make a lot of money. And so they're tempted then to go into sex work. Um, and so the women themselves, though, that were in the red light districts or in, um, in these other factory jobs, and they, they knew that their potential future could be in sex work, they, they pushed back against these ideas. They pushed back against these ideas that they were immoral. They pushed back against these ideas that they were being trafficked because traffic, white slave traffic, trafficking in women was a term always used to kind of, I call it a... Um, a moral panic, right? Uh, so you you drum up this moral panic because women could be trafficked. These innocent women could be trafficked into prostitution. And for the white slave um, legislation that came out, the Man Act that came out in 1910, it it, it wasn't usually even used. To, to punish people who supposedly took women across state lines for, quote, immoral purposes. Immoral purposes was very vague on purpose. Um, it was mostly used by, you know, to punish Black men for being with a white woman, for marrying a white woman, Jack Johnson, the boxer. He was um, arrested on white slave uh, White, the white slave law, the man act, because he had a white wife. And of course he had to be taking her across uh, the border for sex work, or um, it was used against um, labor organizers. So um, industrial workers of the world, you know, the anarchists, the fear of anarchy, of communism, um, they, uh, any time that, the, the wobblies is what they called themselves. Anytime that they got into a car, men and women got into this car and went across state lines. A lot of times they would go from Chicago to the Pacific Northwest. When they crossed state lines, they would be arrested and charged in the Man Act. And so um, that's, but these are women, these were women and men that, um, didn't actually work in the sex industry, but women that did work in the sex industry uh, did fight back. So a lot of my work looks at, on both sides of the border, both Texas and Mexico. On the Texas side in the early 20th century, I, I look at um, sex workers who, who use the legal system. To, to push back against, against how they were labeled, um, their job. Their, even during that time, women were saying, we should not be criminalized. What we're doing should not be against the law. Um, one of the cases that I look at is Thelma Denton. So Thelma Denton was, uh, worked as a prostitute and then became a very successful madam. Um, her brothel was raided by police because she was a black woman who uh, had white women working for her. And at the time in Houston in 1908, 
they wanted to segregate the red light district, um, mainly to so that black men could not have access to white women's bodies. And um, she refused. She was arrested. All of the women in her brothel were arrested. And all of those women then sued the city, um, called for injunctions to decriminalize what they are doing. Their, uh, their argument was that if the city of Houston created a red light district and you put us in this red light district to work and you said, this is where you have to stay. And it was called the reservation, by the way. Um, and this is where you have to stay. Then while we're in this district, if we don't leave this district, then our work should be decriminalized. And this, this is how women at the time who worked in the sex industry, this is how they saw themselves. This is how they saw their work. Um, and this is how they fought back and organizing, which that was, they didn't call it labor organizing for themselves, but you could see them organizing amongst each other, madams and, and the workers who worked in their brothel. They're organizing to use the legal system to push back. Um, workers in Mexico did very similar things. There was even a protest, a march in Mexico City of um, sex workers in the early 20th century that uh, to protest um, their regulation. So Dr. Snow talks a lot about um, surveillance in Mexico, in Mexico, you know, where prostitution was legalized, they had, um, what I've written about is these passports, they were pink passports and they were medical passports. And so women had to, women who worked in the sex industry in the early 20th century, and up until I think the 90s, they had to take these medical passports and have compulsory um, medical tests to make sure that they did not have venereal disease. And so with these passports, they had to go in, they had to pay their own money, they had to see the doctor, they had to get a stamp in their passport in order for them to continue to work in the sex industry in the red light districts. And so uh, they marched against this regulation. They marched against the surveillance. They organized, Mexico of course has a very long history of, uh, of um, labor organizing. And so the, the understanding is there, the idea is there. They didn't call themselves a labor organization. They didn't form a labor organization but they are organizing under the idea that we are laborers, that what we do is legalized. You should not criminalize us, should not surveil us and, um, and use the legal system, use the same system to push back against it. I, I have another example to add to that and that's from Cuba where sex workers organized at the end of the 19th century. They created a newspaper. Uh, they call themselves workers, trabajadoras, and they demanded rights. And they railed against the colonial government, against the police, against the state. Um, so very early on, uh, of course, the newspaper was outlawed, and um, and that was the end of that. But I, I have a short video. Maybe we could show it now. Uh, and you'll see one of the um, papers that is still in the archives. Most accounts of the origins of the sex worker movement reference organizations in the global north. In the Americas, however, the conception of prostitution as a form of labor started with a Caribbean collective of prostitutes who sought to organize politically to demand their rights as workers. In the late 1800s in Havana, Cuba, sex workers organized and published their own newspaper. 
They wrote about policies that impacted their lives as working women, and they envisioned a political party by and for sex workers. In this article, we highlight some contemporary advances, such as in Nicaragua, where the sex worker organization Girasoles de Nicaragua, Sunflowers of Nicaragua, has recently made headway in the struggle for awareness of their rights. Nicaragua is the first country in the world that has trained sex workers to resolve conflicts within their jurisdiction. They are officially trained and accredited by the Supreme Court of Justice as judicial facilitators. They resolve conflicts related to sex work and other community issues and strive to prevent and decrease violence. This conflict resolution model reduces caseloads in the courts and enhances communication between the justice system and sex workers. In 2018, in another part of Spanish-speaking America, a group of mostly trans sex workers in Santa Fe, Colombia, created a mural that later inspired a printed newspaper called La Esquina, The Corner. Staffed by trans sex workers, La Esquina is a media space where community members share information of local interest, such as how to avoid complications related to surgical procedures, get a job, how to make cheap meals, and how to take better care of their health. Funded by nonprofit organizations, La Esquina has a mural edition that is laminated and pasted to walls on street corners where sex workers congregate to wait for their clients. It also has a regular print edition that is distributed to brothels and other businesses in the area patronized by sex workers. La Esquina addresses the interests, needs, and empowerment of a disadvantaged community that is doubly discriminated against for being trans and sex workers. La Esquina offers the opportunity to visually communicate stories. Without La Esquina, those stories would not be told. In Argentina, the sex worker organization AMAR has cleverly used public spaces to drive home a political message. The organization started an innovative campaign in 2013 by adorning walls with murals on various street corners in Buenos Aires. Depicting women on one side and children on the other, the visual campaign stressed that 86% of Argentine sex workers are mothers, bringing attention to the fact that sex workers are women with family obligations and connections. These are women who are integrated into their community as mothers and breadwinners. The murals not only facilitated neighborhood discussions and awareness, but this labor rights campaign also received widespread media attention, even winning an international prize from a public relations and communications magazine. Ahmad produced another impactful intervention in the form of a public sphere performance where activists randomly distributed fake invoices for sexual services rendered, complete with price details. The campaign also targeted journalists, opinion leaders, and politicians, among others. The objective was to make evident that sexual services involve a financial transaction similar to other enterprises with obligations and rights. Finally, Jacqueline Montero is the president of Modemo, a sex worker organization in the Dominican Republic and an elected official in the Congress of the Dominican Republic. These are only a few examples. All over Latin America and the Caribbean, sex workers are organizing to raise awareness and demand their human rights. This is a project that your students put together. Created by my students. I'm not bragging. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Do it, do it. They're awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. Um, that, that's lovely. Uh, and this sort of gets us into our next piece of the conversation at lunch, which um, just this engagement between sex workers and another one. And I wonder what you all think about the question of what prevents or maybe what helps build solidarity between sex workers and workers in other industries. Um, and to tag on to that, maybe a, a different question, but I think related, how do popular representations and conceptions of sex work guide public conversations and public policy about sex, sex work and sex work? Oh, about TV, film, literature. Can I start historically? Take us all the way back to 
early nights or early uh, 1900s. Please. Um, so what I'm seeing in my own work is what I didn't expect um, because of this idea of morality and uh, women who worked in red light districts being ostracized. That, that, that's what I expected going in. Uh, women being uh, labeled, which they were, of course, to white middle-class society. But what I'm seeing in my own work is this solidarity between poor working class women and um, and women who work in the sex industry. So with a, a series of public hearings um, in the in the by 1913, <laughs> Uh, progressive reformers, middle class white people mostly, uh, wanted, were connecting sex work and low wages. So their argument to get a minimum <clears throat> wage for women, a what they called a living wage for women uh, in industry was by saying that the low wages paid to women was the, the root of uh, women going into sex work. And so I'm juggling with this. I'm trying to unpack this idea because there's there's so many opinions around it then and his, you know historians' opinions around it. But what I, I tried to do was listen to the women themselves. So in the hearings in Chicago, they bring in women who work in the levy district, which, which was the most well-known um, red light district in Chicago and women there were saying and arguing for <laughs> the minimum wage for women uh, in 1913 because they're saying when I there was one woman we're only known as AR she said when I worked in the steam laundries I only made four dollars a week now that I am a sex worker at 38 years old, uh, I'm making $40 a week. That, that's a huge amount for her at the time. She says, you know, I, I send my children to boarding school. I don't get to know my children, but I'm essentially getting them out of this cycle of poverty. You know, this caste system, if you will, of, of working class, of poor working class. And so I'm seeing this solidarity because then women who work in industry, they're, they're talking about, we don't see women in red light districts as immoral. This is not an immor immorality question. It's an economic question. And so, so, and to promote this idea of a living wage for women in industry. Um, and that wasn't just in Chicago, uh, coming back down into Texas, they're doing the same thing from, from Dallas to El Paso to Laredo to San Antonio. Every time the Industrial Welfare Commission in Texas is going to these different cities to study, um, study issues in industry and talk about this connection between low wages and prostitution, both working class women and sex workers who testify in these hearings are saying we need a living wage legislation for women because of uh, how not only dehumanizing it is for legislation again, you know, with red light districts and whatnot, but also the incredibly low wages that um, industry is paying women and, and these connections. So Regardless of this, this larger idea of, um, you know, does low wages cause women to fall and to fall, I'm going to use air quotes again, that's my favorite thing to do, <laughs> um, to fall into prostitution, to be a soil dove, I'm going to use all the horrible terminology they had. Um, regardless of, you know, kind of the historical discussion around that, these women are coming together. There is solidarity between the poor working class and sex workers on trying to get this legislation passed. That's what I'm seeing. Thank you.
Yeah, so from Latin America there and the Caribbean, there are some examples of solidarity. Um, Argentina, since 1994, some of their labor unions have incorporated the sex worker movement. Uruguay, more recently, I would say in the last 20 years, uh, sex workers fought for the right to be incorporated into uh, the mainstream <laughs> unions. And in a few other places, um, Guatemala, Nicaragua, Colombia, sex, Brazil, sex work is recognized as a form of labor by the state. That doesn't seem to do a lot for sex workers on the ground um, because the condition, conditions for workers are uh, so poor, so precarious to begin with. Uh, and because the police are not trained, uh, clients are not trained, so um, sex workers are still subject to a lot of forms of um, stigma, violence, uh, marginalization in their societies and culture. So um, I, I feel like sex workers have been championing for these rights for a long time. Uh, and the struggle to get acceptance has been a complete uphill battle. Yeah, I would say that the um, just massive stigma cannot be understated, like, at all. Um, and I believe that is the primary um, obstacle that sex workers face in really being perceived as human, let alone as workers. Like, let's start, like, <laughs> like we're not even, yeah we're not even saying it's human yet so like let, let's get to that point um and i mean uh the way that sex work is um i mean often a almost all maybe not almost all exact numbers but like a, a, a last resort um people who are already multiply mar marginalized in um myriad ways are disproportionately represented in sex work right so um, trans women are disproportionately represented in sex work. Women of color, black women, especially queer people, uh, gender non-conforming fall, uh, poor people, of course, the economic um, uh, driver, you know, to the industry. Um, and the, I'm just functioning as a sex worker, being um, operating under that title uh, generates just massive levels of hate that I think isn't really uh, legible to most um, or many maybe. Uh, so as for solidarity with non-sex workers, I found personally it's less with other low wage laborers and more with other criminalized mm -hmm. and stigmatized populations. So drug users, queer folks, drug sellers, or drug, drug sellers, drug dealers. Um, <laughs> tend to be um, far more amenable to sex workers and our um, attempts at achieving some semblance of human rights than other low wage workers who, in my experience, and I mean, you know, in like 2024 United States, generally want to distance themselves from sex workers as much as possible. They don't want to be confused for being a sex worker. Um, and I mean, I think the public perception of that too you know, I, I really got into this field right before COVID hit. Um, and one thing I've noticed is that like pre-COVID, if I were to say um, I'm a sex worker, then people would assume that I meant I'm a full service sex worker, but always assume that. Now, now if I say I'm a sex worker, people always assume that I'm on OnlyFans. Um, yeah, never seen, and I always get some like really disgusting, like dehumanizing comment, like, oh, so you post your pussy on the internet? And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it's just this, uh, um, the total dehumanization, um, is I think related to, I mean, it's related to morality. It's related to these ideas of shame and that like nobody would post their post, um, you know, their like intimate body, whatever, um, on the internet. Um, but, uh, shoot, what was I trying to say? Uh, dehumanization, um, we found morality. morality. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, like right, yeah, the, the biggest barrier really is just like, people don't 
don't want to be near some, like it's like like you like you know people um will immediately ask like about sexually transmitted infections um people assume that um you know if being in any close proximity to us somehow implicates them in the sex trade whether that's as a client or as a sex worker um and i'd say especially because we have to function in these sort of relational networks to create any type of community amongst ourselves uh that additionally kind of brings its own um uh what's what i'm looking for uh, well, on one hand, people don't want to be part of that network. And on the other hand, sex workers are so used to being treated like garbage by the general population that we don't typically want to let them in anyway. Um, so, I mean, I think those are the major. Can barriers. I just do a follow up on that? Because I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by what you said, too, because what I'm seeing in my own work is, you know, the paradox of progressivism, right? Uh, the contradiction in the this kind of conservative view of trying to be the white savior to help um, a certain group of the population, but at the same time, you end up uh, stigmatizing them even more and dehumanizing even more with this idea. So in the, in the progressives in the early 1900s, they, they, at the same time that they're trying to humanize women who work in the sex industry in red light districts, um, anti-vice commissions are also um, lurking about, uh, historically we call it slumming, right? Uh, it's fascinating. All of these progressive reformers love to go into the red light district and peek into windows, right? Or write up their reports or, or have uh, they, or, or take pictures. Um, JT of Church had a purity journal that he loved to go into the red light district and take pictures and then and then put those in his purity <laughs> journal and say, you know, we have to be more sensational than the uh, than the sensational magazines. So people will want to help. Um, and so at the same time that they're trying to humanize these women by by helping them get out of prostitution uh, with these, you know, Magdalene homes. Uh, the Florence Crichton home was one of the most famous. Um, homes for erring girls. Um, at the same time they're doing that, they're also, these anti-vice groups are trying to um, shut down red light districts. So in 1917, when you have World War I, Newton Baker comes in and tells these cities that if they don't shut down their red light districts, they can't have a military base. That military base is going to bring in all kinds of revenue. So these they shut down uh, the red light districts. Well, then what happens when the red light districts are shut down? The brothels are shut down. When the brothels are shut down, when, when and, and I'm not advocating for being a madam. I mean, uh, we could go into that whole discussion elsewhere, but with being with a madam, a woman was over the home. Uh, she hired security. She, uh, was very particular about who came into these brothels. Once the brothels were shut down, uh, the women scattered um, across the city. And then this is where you get the rise of, um, of pimps, of, of men being over the sex industry, men being the leaders of the sex industry instead of women being in, uh, leaders of the sex industry. So there's a whole patriarchal thing that could go into uh, with that. But as that happens, um, you, you, not that they were, not that women in sex work were ever necessarily humanized or taken care of or anything like that. But once this happens, you see the increase of dehumanization. You see the increase of, um, of violence uh, against sex workers. Now, let me be very clear though. Um, brothels was a very privileged position uh, for sex work because um, you aged out, usually aged out of brothels into cribs and then into street walking, which cribs and street walking were extraordinarily dangerous. Um, I had a, and I have just a couple of, of questions left and I'm going to open it up for for all of you to ask uh, your questions. 
but I had a question here that I was thinking about asking <clears throat> I put together when this panel came together about the unique challenges of sex workers. But I, I now realize that that's in some ways really obvious, right? And we've been talking about them already. Please feel free to say more about the challenges. But maybe the better or more productive question um, is what unique opportunities do sex workers have to organize, to fight back against injustice, uh, to assert their, their bodily and economic autonomy? Uh, and what can people in other industries, what can other workers learn from? Um, well, I think one of the most important skills to have as a sex worker, especially if you're trying to organize, but just in general, is that we are really good at subterfuge and hiding and lying and going undetected so that we don't go to jail. Um, and I think that, I mean, that's just, you know, but yeah, and I don't want to be like, I advocate for lying, but like, I kind of do. Um, in some cases, um, you know, I'm thinking of, um, you know, I've been seeing recently that a lot of um, pro-Palestinian accounts have been getting kicked off of platforms like PayPal, um, platforms like, you know, Venmo, which is owned by PayPal, uh, Cash App, GoFundMe. Um, and my immediate thinking is like, well, why do they know what you're raising money for? Like, <laughs> that you should absolutely not be um sharing that type of information with these institutions because even if it doesn't violate their terms of service it is going to be activity that aligns with what they consider to be high risk and you're going to get through it um so like the survival mechanism excuse me mechanisms that come out of the constant surveillance and just the utter disregard for our safety or survival um, and I, I mean, and I, I hate to like put a silver lining on oppression, but like, um, has really, um, or has, or creates, um, I don't know, circumstances that I think a lot of labor movements could benefit from, especially the way that we, like, we've seen how union busting happens. It's, yeah. it's endemic. Um, and, you know, sex workers, I think are very, um, not privileged, but like positioned in a way to um, to do harm reduction in ways that other non-criminalized workers and non-signatized workers are not. Um, I think there's a couple of opportunities. One has to do with <clears throat> domestic workers. Um, and if we can organize domestic workers, and there's been domestic worker movements in Latin America now for a long time, that will make it easier because there's a conflation between domestic work and prostitution and sex work. These things usually go together. They're very connected. I think if those organizations continue to strengthen, that's gonna be very uh, fruitful for sex workers. The other thing that's been happening since the mid 1990s are these transnational networks from Argentina all the way into Mexico, into the Caribbean of sex workers. They get together every year, they conduct studies, they, have, they do position papers, they work with governments, they have celebrations. So never before in history has this happened where sex workers can come together. Uh, there's a few organizations. One is Repra Sex. That's been around the longest since the 1990s. And the other one is Placards. And that's more recent, probably in the last 15 years. Um, a lot of the money comes from HIV AIDS and UNAIDS uh, funding these organizations. So um, in a way, that pandemic was so disastrous for sex workers, but at the same time, it helped to start a movement of empowering them because it poured a lot of money into uh, education, educating sex workers, not because they cared about sex workers, but they care about, about the clients not getting infected with HIV AIDS. And that has fueled the system quite a bit. And across national uh, boundaries, is, that's really been so important. 
Um, for me, it's just working the system, like knowing the system. Um, I I often joke that the progressive era, the early 20th century was a time of organizing and conferences. Like all these women, no matter what they did, there was an organization and then there was a conference. Um, and they were amazing at it. And so for sex workers specifically, I think that if, if you've got to circumvent the system, if you've got to try to play the system before the system gets you, then you have to know the system. And so I think um, what we can learn is knowing the system, knowing the system in and out, and then playing the system back on itself. But also within this kind of capitalist structure, um, both the progressives and um, sex workers specifically, uh, <laughs> within this capitalist structure, used a very kind of um, socialist idea that these organizations needed funding. And so they came together uh, and, and sex workers were able to do it. Madams especially had extraordinary power because they were so wealthy. Right. They invested their money back into more land, more brothels, but they but they could influence people. They influenced police. They influenced governments. They influenced local politics. Um, there's, they had so much money, but they often used that money um, back into the women. I don't want to say that they didn't exploit, but they they put that money back into um fighting legislation that hurt everyone in the red light district. Um, of course, you know, wealthy progressives did the same thing for their organizations for suffrage and, and whatnot. But uh, but this is one thing that that women in vice districts um, in the early 20th century did really well. They organized really well. They used their funding really well. Um, and they knew the system really well and used that same system to fight against it. We have such a great turnout that, that I think I'll, I'll end with my questions here and open it up for questions from the audience. Um, please forgive me if I don't know or can't see your name. I'll just have to really point at you. Um, and it will make it work. So I'm going to open it up for folks to ask their questions for our wonderful panelists. And uh, let's, let's do that now. Who wants to start? Please. Um, so can you talk about the value of decriminalization in terms of uh, labor organizing and just asserting the humanity of sex workers as a community? For anyone who wants to answer. <laughs> Well, I think it's important too to distinguish between criminal decriminalization and legalization, which are very different um, and often confused. So legalization is like what we see in Europe, the Nordic model. Um, and that is when sex work is, um, and specifically full service sex work, uh, also professional domination, um, is highly regulated. Um, and there are certain laws in place that, um, I mean, are about as arbitrary as the laws here are, um, that will criminalize your work. For example, in uh, the UK, you can't share a space with another sex worker where you're, you know, you're both using it to work. Um, obviously, it makes sense if you want to, you know, power numbers, you want to work with um, other people for your own safety. Um, but doing that means that under the law, you are trafficking the other, you just trafficking the other. So you'd both get uh, busted for that, yes. Um, decriminalization, on the other hand, is just being left alone. Like that's like, it's just not illegal. Just like having sex not for money isn't <laughs> illegal. <laughs> like, um, yeah, yeah so that, yeah, well, <laughs> um, <laughs> it was, it was. Uh, yeah, no, and no. <laughs> They're, they're coming from more sweet texts. But um, uh, that means that, I mean, even under a legalization model or the Nordic model, sex workers are still very subject to police raids and harassment by the state. 
I mean, we still see this with like strip clubs. Um, if some just the minutia of some of the laws in strip clubs that like, you know, you need to have your heels need to be X inches or lower than X inches or like, yeah. Oh, oh they, they vary state by state, but they're absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> but like, you know, you can't um, show a nipple or else they're gonna, oh, yeah. yeah, right. It's absurd. Um, but these modes of uh, like semi-criminalization and surveillance pose just an incredible risk to organizing because we're subject to police raids whenever they want or subject to um, eviction or subject to having our funds seized and our accounts frozen. Um, so I'd say decriminalization is one of, one of if not the most important, um, uh, I guess, barrier mm -hmm. to um, organizing. Yeah, we, um, in the early 20th century, they didn't have that, that terminology, but from what everything that I can see is that uh, the women themselves were advocating for decriminalization because they did not, one, uh, if they were specifically working within the red light district, you know, as I said before, if they're, they're arguing that if I have to stay in this district, then my work within this district should be, should not be criminalized uh, or decriminalized, but also uh, they didn't want the compulsory uh, hospitalizations. They didn't want the compulsory um, medical examinations. They didn't want um the city governments especially to come in and desegregate uh or or not desegregate segregate the uh the red light districts uh you know i have quotes that um especially with white supremacy in texas not that it's over but that's over um uh the they the officers the, the legal system in Houston, especially, wanted to segregate the red, the brothels because they, the quote was, they didn't want red light districts to become examples of integration, like good examples of integration. And so, because of course that was criminalized to have sex for a, a black and white person to have sex in uh, Texas in the early, in the, well, everywhere but i'm talking specifically in texas that was criminalized as well and um, so they're advocating for uh to decriminalize uh sex uh interracial sex this is in the early 1900s um decriminalize sex work especially sex workers who have sex with um interracial sex decriminalize that decriminalize um the you know, the trade within the district, but also not to have compulsory. Uh, so all of that would fall under that. I would, I, there's not the the terminology there, but all of it falls under your definition, absolutely. Well, and I think to like, I mean, I'm not a full service sex worker, so I'm not subject to the same type of policing and surveillance as full service sex workers are. But even so, um, anyone in, any corner of the sex industry is going to be subject. I mean, we're all perceived as the same thing, and we're all perceived as whores, regardless. Um, and like our, um, whether we're in a strip club or a dungeon, or whether we're at home by ourselves making content or in a porn studio, um, we're all going to be subjected to that same uh, state violence um, that's trying to like sniff out the full service sex yeah. work that we're like not supposed to be doing but are secretly doing. Um, so I, I think I didn't really mention that uh, decrim is so important for solidarity between different categories of the sex trade. Um, but it uh, it really does draw a hard line between yeah. the most marginalized sex workers and the more privileged. Well, and like in 1909, Mamie Strauss, who I love, by the way, uh, was a, a black sex worker in Fort Worth in um, Hell's Half Acre. She was punished. She was arrested and punished for having sex with a white man. Police raided her, her room, 
essentially because they knew that a white man was in there. He was pulling up his pants. They don't know. They say, well, you don't know what we were doing or if we had had sex already. And, um, and she, she fought back. She sued the government. She took this case all the way up to the Texas Supreme court. And even in 1909 is saying that there should be no law against interracial sex, that that should be decriminalized. And this is before loving the loving case in the 1960s. Right. So that's, what's so fascinating with the whole decriminalization to me is these women, uh, sex workers are advocating for all of this decriminalization around their bodies, um, even from the early 1900s. I have a question. So this is a very big question to all of you, so I apologize in advance, but um, I'm interested in the in urban spaces as um, both like promoting sex work, but also maybe dampening or um, repressing sex work. So early 1900s, for example, Buenos Aires, right? <laughs> um, right they had this like great opportunity for European um, immigrants and European prostitutes to flourish, but of course for women of color, for um, actual Argentinian women, that can be kind of hard or come between lines, but then Fast forward super to um, like 2020s Mexico City and this kind of neo-colonial um, influx of population coming in, expats, especially due to the pandemic and neighborhoods like La Merced in Mexico City, which is, you know, very well known for sex work. And it's also just kind of known for the third age prostitutes that Maya Godin uh, featured in, in Plaza de la Soledad. Um, so like older women who have been in the system their whole life and don't have the opportunity to get out of it, where do you all see that going in the future? So like with the creation and the huge push for urban spaces that we continue to see across Latin America, um, how is that, and this is, this is where it's vague, yeah. how is that really going to affect sex work in the future or... I can't speak to the future. Y'all can probably speak to the future. I can only give you kind of an example for the past with the promotion and the oppression at the same time is um, while cities, urban areas, especially uh, um, oppressed women in these spaces, created these red light districts, oppressed them. They also created tourist books uh, for tourists to come in. Um, for the reason that any kind of revenue and by revenue, I mean that they would go, the uh, city officials, police would go into the red light districts, arrest, I'm going to use air quotes again, arrest women, which just meant to um, detain them and then make them pay money. And so the city itself, the city of Houston made a hundred thousand dollars a year on, um, on prostitution. City of Dallas made over $100,000 a year on prostitution. So they're promoting it so they can make money. A lot of the a lot of the paved roads in these large cities were done with the money made off of prostitution. The lighting system in these large cities, you go through these large cities and you see all these pretty old light poles yeah, that was purchased on sex work, the, the money from sex work. And so they're both promoting it. This historically, I don't know about what that means for the future, but historically you can see cities are both promoting uh, red light districts and trying to criminalize and suppress the women. Yeah, I would say that's true for the Caribbean, for example, the promotion of uh, Miss Universe in the Dominican Republic was started around uh, promoting Miss Universe within the context of the growth of tourism. So from the very beginning, it's using women's bodies to attract tourists. And, you know, it's it still goes on in, in very um, tangible ways. But we have major cities of the global north, for example, Amsterdam, where you can go there as a tourist and, and a perfectly uh, legitimate tour guide is going to take you to the red light district. And, and that's part of what's 
you know, it's not only uh, those deviant tourists, but it's part of what the city offers in their promotional materials. Come visit our, our red light district. Historic red light districts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, I um, don't know what I could add about Latin America specifically, but I will say that the future looks bleak <laughs> <laughs> with like increase. I mean, the way that technology is developing, I feel like it, it, with increased surveillance, things are only going to get worse before they get better. <laughs> <laughs> like your question, and then we have one from from the, the internet. So uh, let's get your question. We have one. I'm going to jump in. Um, so my question is, how has the rights of platforms like OnlyFans, which you can completely have independence over um, your income, the way that you um, kind of have that sex work? Um, how has the rise of the changed the landscape for a human rights organizing, uh, specifically in terms of autonomy and revenue generation? That's really a question. <laughs> it's a really good question. <laughs> yeah. um, well, I think one thing OnlyFans did, especially with its explosion <laughs> coinciding with the pandemic, is that people who identify as sex workers vastly increased. Um, but people whose economic situations just <laughs> fell apart in catastrophic waves also very much increased. Um, so I think that there's been a major rise in visibility. Um, I'm not sure how exactly I would link that to human rights organizing because most of the organizing that I have seen has been more of a right-wing kind of um, anti-trafficking. That's really just, <laughs> we want to collect your data. Yeah. Um, since, since only, so yeah, no, I'm interested in, in what y'all might have to add. I cannot answer your question, but I can <laughs> give you the name of someone who could. She's working on Colombia because that is the hub in Latin America for, um, this only fans and she knows a lot she's been doing ethnographic <clears throat> research there and she knows about a lot about who's controlling what so kind of like the political economy of it in colombia i can give you her name later oh, on sorry. oh i'd also read heather berg mm -hmm. um she, she wrote porn work yeah she, that's yeah a she focuses work. a that's lot a on one. um like content the only thing that i could add to that is you know, and this is just me observing is the the discussion that it's created, the new discourse that it's created around um, morality. Like, how do we define morality? Um, who, I what what I observed is more people defending the rights to have that autonomy um and and how how we define it and how we define um sex work how we define um is it more you know morality around it uh, and, and I, i'm going back to the the larger discussions that we've had both academically and um politically in a place like Utah, you know, where you have, uh, where you have teachers who don't get paid very much at all. Um, and of course, teaching is supposed to be this moral profession of women, right? Um, you, you get out of college and you go into teaching, you're doing something better for society. And so you have this dichotomy of, um, women who are doing the moral thing right out of college and going and, and teaching high school students. And then because they don't have very much money or they can't live in a place like Utah, which is so expensive to live, um, they do an OnlyFans and make a million dollars. And so, you know, there's a discussion around should we not fire teachers who have 
an OnlyFans page? Because if we do, I mean, we already have a teacher shortage. Like, what do we, what do we do there? Do we have to pay teachers more? So it opens up this discourse on, and I think that OnlyFans has done that, you know, scholarly, I don't know, academically, I, I, I don't have, you know, anything to, to push you towards to read, but um, just as an observation, I see that, that, that this is a larger discourse or I, I, people talking about it more, that it's not immoral, that it's, uh, it needs to be um, addressed kind of in this, this social setting of, of rights and, um, and, and, you know, how we look at women in this in industry. Well, and I think what's especially interesting about this discourse is that the assumption is that uh, creators on OnlyFans are making just a ton of money, but that's not at all the case. The average take home uh, monthly from OnlyFans is something like a hundred, between a hundred and two hundred dollars. Um, yeah, it's no, like, very rarely um, do we see the lead million dollars. And I think it's these rare cases that come out in the media well, because it's more it's likely, so yeah, yeah, like, it's more likely you'll get recognized if you have more subscribers. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah of course. Um, but, you know, I think also, especially with teaching, you know, um, the side note, did y'all know that Pittsburgh teachers get paid more than teachers in almost every part of the country? Are they organized? They, is well, it I mean, labor it union? union town, but, um, yeah. Oh, there's the... Because we didn't, <laughs> we didn't unionize in Texas, and so... But, um, I mean, making $38,000 a year is totally fine if you are a heterosexual woman married to um, a man with a, like, yeah, a big boy salary or whatever. It's, it's only it's like, salary. yeah, it's only like single women who are single unmarried women whose sexuality is already going to be policed more heavily than others Absolutely. who, yeah, end up Absolutely. Um, on OnlyFans. Well, and and like teachers in general, um, they're they're predominantly women. They've you know always always been predominantly women, and this was seen as supplemental income. And so that was a justification to not pay teachers. And then you have a state like Texas, which is um, a right to work state, right? And so teachers are forbidden from unionizing. And if you do unionize or, or you do protest against uh, your low pay, uh, you lose your teacher certificate. Period. So you lose your um, ability to work uh, in Texas, and so um, so yeah. Let's talk about patriarchy and <laughs> oh, perfect segue. Uh, that's yeah. actually a perfect segue to this question, and then we should have time for one or two more. Questions. Questions. And then, yeah, there, there's one more in the okay. Q and A. All right, so uh, we'll take this one, and uh, then let's see how much time we have. Andrew Dorking wrote how porn <clears throat> and the industry will always just create violence against women. There seems to be a push now uh, on sex work being empowered. Do you think uh, under under patriarchy, sex work can truly be empowered to women? <laughs> so, I mean, I take umbrage with the um, dichotomy between sex work being, um, what was the word that working, or uh, what's the word? Um, Empowering or the bad one is the bad one. Um, uh, to, I, well, let's just go with the humanizing because I can't remember what it is. Um, and I mean, <clears throat> what is the primary driver of violence against women is the economy and poverty. So I really like, I wonder, well, like, what, what is more of a risk to women? Is it um, making money by like, by, having sex with someone that um, they, you know, found on a website that they chose to go on specifically to find a client? Or is it the violence of homelessness and of hunger and of incarceration and all of the other um, just horrific realities that come with poverty, especially now that, like, we have the worst, um, like, wealth disparity I think since the Gilded Age like that seems a lot more violent to me than and given like I'm like I, I'm a dom like all I do is violence not against women usually. but um, <laughs> I, that seems a lot more violent to me than you know taking some selfies and putting them on 
I think there's a moral judgment in the question because we don't think that about uh, domestic work, which is something that a lot of women are relegated to, where they're low paid, where there's certain levels of violence. And uh, we never say, let's get all domestic workers out of the industry. How about construction workers? Or, yeah. or yeah, I think it's just all women in general. I think women face violence you know, in marriage. in marriage, I think women face violence in their jo- in any job that they have. Women face violence in walking down the street. Women face violence in their marriages. I, you know, I think uh, the patriarchy um, breeds that violence. Well, and I will say from experience that the way I'm treated by clients in a dungeon is far far superior than the way I'm treated by colleagues and students at the university. Absolutely. And I, I think that, and I think that, um, I, I think that, you know, poverty, which is the root, you know, the central to my work, just like you were saying, I think poverty is, is a big factor in that. Um, the patriarchy though works to keep women impoverished uh, I mean, there's a reason we couldn't have our own bank account until 50 years ago. Right. Like, right. <laughs> uh, there's a reason that we're the, you know, the pay gap is still there. There's a reason why we still have um, predominantly uh, woman jobs, right? Um, you know, there all these surveys or these, these, this information comes out that, that there's so many women in college now, like there's more women in universities than there are men. Yeah. But where are we funneled to, right? Where, what kind of, um, degrees are we relegated to (laughs) nursing and teaching that that's the largest fields on a lot of campuses. I don't know how it is here, but especially in the South, um, most of your women in universities are in nursing and teaching degrees. And so I think, and, and, and sometimes those are the lower paying jobs, especially teaching. And so I think the poverty and patriarchy has a lot to do with that. Yeah, I think money's empowering and having more of it means that you have more power. Yeah, look at so. the madams. <laughs> look at the madams in the early 20th century, right? The madams had a ton of power. Ton yeah, of that's power. how it works. Yeah. Did we take the other online question? Or? Yeah, it's it's somewhat related to um, the, the, the the issue that was brought up in terms of the relationship between domestic work and sex work. And to the extent that you can uh, discuss that potential connection. Um, the approach that I take is one that looks at it as social reproduction, the kind of invisible labor that women do within families, within homes to reproduce laborers, to reproduce the next class of workers. And that is uh, supposedly we do out of uh, biology or or love or whatever, but it's still uh, work that is not paid, that is not considered to be a form of labor. So prostitution um, only becomes a problem for society when women ask to be paid, when women uh, within marriage, uh, it's a contract, historically has been a contract where women are supposed to provide sex for free and domestic work for free in relation to living within the patriarchal household. And so um, domestic work is taking, is uh, kind of industrializing that labor that is done, that's supposed to be done by the wife, by the woman, by the mother, and so is sex work. And so there's that very close connection. There's also very um, strong, uh, very high levels of abuse against sex workers. Um, they are often raped in the families where they work, live in domestics. Uh, they are often subject to violence. So very, there's a lot of commonalities and uh, a lot of domestic workers then uh, go into sex work because it pays more. 
In most societies, sex work is what pays um, women the highest wage. Yeah. Historically, too, um, you have this shift in the industrial era, um, Gilded Age industrial era, where you have um, the majority of your domestic labor, a lot of your domestic labor were uh, European immigrants of some, some sort. And then as industrialization happens and more and more uh, European immigrants who are falling under this umbrella of whiteness now with Americanization programs um, are not going into domestic work because of the surveillance uh, behind domestic work um, and going into factory jobs. And so then... Uh, not that it hadn't been, but then you have more of a racialization of domestic work. So now you have um, predominantly Black women are going to be uh, domestic workers where uh, white, native-born and foreign-born white women are going to go into the factories. Um, and then white middle-class families, white upper-class families are trying, are, because they're losing their white domestic labor are going to start arguing that um, domestic labor is actually what keeps women out of prostitution because now you're um, in a, a, a realm of moral protection is the way that they frame it, uh, progressive reformers especially. So they, they frame it that women need to come back to domestic work because we are, we can protect them um, from falling into prostitution because it's the factory worker women that fall into prostitution. Domestic workers are protected. Uh, it's a fallacy, but that's the, that's the, the discussion. One last thing, there's a researcher at UCLA, a PhD student who's looking into uh, domestic work <clears throat> and sex work at Harvard, she's in government and public policy. So I think in the next few years, we'll see some article, Jessica about yeah. here, yeah. So we'll see articles and books on that topic. She's a great researcher. Are we well, we, we, can, um, we can have whoever has additional questions, if you have the, the time. There uh, was one back there. Uh, Do we have time for one more question or should we? Sure. And, one and then, question. Question. And then and then we can, yeah, then we can mingle for a bit. Um, and then I have to take these wonderful people to dinner. <laughs> let's, let's hear your question. Sure. Uh, so Dr. Snow, can you tell us, uh, can you tell us the difference between a madam, a pimp, and a sex worker? And how SESTA and FOSTA plays into it? Yes, yeah, okay. So that's, I, this is a really <laughs> important dis uh, distinction. So, um, and we've been like throwing some of these terms around. So a sex worker, um, you, as we know, someone who sells or trades sex um, or, you know, sexual content, whatever. Um, madam and pimp are both terms that are not really used so much anymore. Um, madam might refer to a woman who operates a brothel and hires, um, hires uh, full service sex workers to work within it. Um, which is legally indistinguishable from pimp, which um, at this point is, is just like a racialized slur, um, a racialized term. Pimp, I think more than anything, um, conjures this figure of like a, like a predatory, often a man of color, often black men, um, who are abusing or trafficking white women. Um, the word pimp also has these associations of being non-consensual and being um, trafficking rather than um, sex work, which is by definition not trafficking. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, and we think of a, a pimp as like a scary person who's going to like hide in a corner or shadow or whatever and like steal a, a white girl from a mall parking lot or whatever. Um, but <laughs> Um, the way that uh, FOSTA SESTA, which is the Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act and Stop Enabling Sex Trafficking Acts, 
um, that passed in April 2018 um, further complicates this is that it implicates anyone who facilitates sex work in any way or facilitates prostitution in any way um, legally a pimp. Um, so, um, and, and as, uh, like, excuse me, in as much as they, they use the internet, so to do so, so like, like, I took an Uber to this <laughs> event. If I were also going to be seeing a client later, then that Uber driver could be charged with sex trafficking yeah. under FOSTA SESTA. Um, so I think, um, yeah, the district really like, and then like on the ground, what I, what I think we think of as pimp, I'm like, oh, that's my manager. Like yeah. I have my favorite pimp, <laughs> and then I have a manager that I don't like. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I'm really glad you asked that question because I wanted to comment on the racialization of the word pimp. Yeah. And historically, um, uh, like early 19 or early, yeah, early 20th century, it was just a distinction between men and women. So women were madams, men were pimps, if, and then they were all in the sex industry. Uh, they were all sex workers um, or classified as sex workers. Yeah, I don't think, like, the racialization will come um, later. The Yeah, I mean, I don't think that an owner of a brothel or a dungeon or whatever would consider themselves a sex worker. Um, they they did in the early 20th century I mean, unless they overlap but like yeah. um today that most of the most of the madams um began as what we would classify as prostitutes um and then ended up owning their own brothel well, and so then they 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 now I don't know about the terminology now this is like yeah a new new for me I don't work in this in this time period um I I am my brain is strictly in the early 20th century but those are the distinctions then but like you know even then like a pimp wouldn't refer to himself as a prostitute no they don't refer to themselves as that at at as all at all um sex the work the terminology sex worker that's did not it, Relative. did not exist then um they didn't nobody classified themselves as a sex worker it was uh it was by their um i guess occupation so prostitute pimp um pimp or madam but the the umbrella the idea of it is they if they were in the vice district all of that was con would have been considered sex work um, but yeah, no, I think that that the distinction really does, I mean, it falls along racialized and gendered lines, and the end goal is always just police violence. Um, and I feel like that's kind of the most important takeaway from these distinctions in a lot of yeah. ways. Um, like the, the the people that we're thinking of as the like most marginalized are going to be um, targeted, Absolutely. and those are going to be sex workers. Well, thank you very much. I want to thank everybody who's here, uh, especially our panelists. I want to thank everybody who's actually near here, or not, <laughs> yeah. in the room. In room. Um, thank everybody for their questions. Uh, if you're a student, please feel free to register for our, our QR code is all over the place. There's still some food outside. Uh, so I'll advertise that as well. And I invite you to come and join us for the rest of the last conference. But I want to thank uh, everybody from uh, who put the, together the seminar, who put together the panel, and for all of you to be part of it.